Well, I don't know. Where do we start? We start with, I was born in England in 1930. For the astrology, it was November, but I'm not going to give you the date. <laughs> Too much power in the date, right? Yeah. Okay. Los Angeles, California, 1931. This time. This time. This I've time. been given glimpses of past semesters, but we won't go to that right now. <laughs> My family was anti-church. Not pagan, anti-church. My grandfather believed that if you walked down a street with a church in it, the evil influence would come out and affect you. And so he didn't want any of his children walking down a street with a church in it. Okay? Wow. He was a very definite old gentleman. Generous to a fault because he was Welsh, you know. But uh, he started a galvanizing company and it ended up with he and his brother in a huge three three plant company. And he would, clo if it was a too hot a day in summer, he would close the whole plant down. And I remember going with them on the train to the beach. This is in the early, late 1930s. So, he, as I say, he was generous to a fault, but he was uh, really a very hard man underneath. And his views we would call nowadays pagan, but in those days it was just anti-church. Just, that was, that was grandpa. Yvonne's family was different. <laughs> oh yeah. 1931, Los Angeles, California, I landed in a Washington Baptist family. That's what I guess I can call my default religion because I would practiced it the best I could until my mid-twenties and then uh, one day I was excited about the work of Emmanuel Velikovsky about how he postulated that Venus had come in and passed Mars and there had been a huge electric shock and then Venus had taken up its own orbit. And uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky, and so my, I was so excited about this, my Sunday school teacher said, if it isn't in the Bible, I don't want to read it, and that's the day I voted with my feet and started a quest of my own for a spiritual path I could subscribe to. It was not a non-win path. Uh, so the search led me through Buddhism and blah, 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 because everybody was doing Buddhism in the 60s, and uh, that wasn't, it was too ephemeral and too something for me. So I finally found spiritualism. And the only thing, the only drawback to living in a small town is the fact that it isn't big enough to support a spiritualist church, as in Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship. I can't thank them enough for what they taught me and the doors they opened to me. From there it was a short step to the craft and Wicca, and I've never looked back. Never looked back. I was, uh going to university as what they called an external student. After the war, there were not places actually in the universities for everybody because we had so many returning troops and they had a, a veterans plan where they could all go to college and be paid. So they, most of them took advantage of that. So the external students worked at little uh, schools in their own home area and then they went to London in my case, because it was London University, to do experimental work in physics, in my case, and to take exams. And in some of those trips to London, I met up with all of these people who had come back from overseas and were vets. And they were non-Christian, very much anti-Christian, because they learned about Eastern religions while they were in the East. Okay, And we got together and one of the demonstrators, the physics department demonstrators, was Leyland and he introduced us to a coven in Cornwall who was willing to teach us the ways. And a group of about 30 of us, I guess, you know, in the pub, eating cheese and pickles and the whole nine yards, decided that we would investigate with these people in Cornwall. Mainly because, of course, the whole idea was freedom. We were not going to be controlled by the church and act this way. We could take our clothes off and, and have fun. 
and um, this led up later on, of course, to the summer of love in, in the United States, much later. Anyway, the, the covenant in Cornwall agreed that we would um, be taught, and they sent us to various lectures in London and to the British Psychic Research Society to be tested for psychic ability. I came out moderate, could improve or something like that, you know. <laughs> and those tapes are probably still in existence because they did reel-to-reel -reel tapes in those days of everything that they did, and they stored them. And probably if somebody had enough guts, they could probably find those tapes still. The British Psychical Research Society. Anyway, um, eventually, five of us decided that we would be initiated. And we traveled down to Cornwall. And we were initiated into this coven's practice, which included sex magic. And uh, there were three... Uh, uh, returning vets, and a young lady and I, uh, who were not returning vets, obviously. So, of course, she and I naturally got together because we were of an age and stuff like that, and the others were older. And we were all initiated uh, at a stone circle, which we, Ron and Raven and I, and several others have visited since then. It's called the Circle of Boscadnan in Cornwall. Uh, the stones, for some reason we don't know, have relatively recently been thrown down. We don't know why that is, but th they're still lying there, and you can still go see the, the circle of Boscot now. Okay. Then uh, I got married and came to the United States because there was no housing in England for for people. Everything was organized towards the veterans and us new people with families, new families didn't have a chance of getting housing. So I went to Canada because if you're living in England, it's okay to go to Canada, but it's not okay to be a traitor and go to the United States, you know. The colonies. The colonies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for the next quite long period, uh, 10 years or so, I was not involved in witchcraft or spiritual development of any sort because I was busy making a living in aerospace. And finally, when the Canadian government shut down their aerospace programs in favor of the St. Louis Seaway, they took the money from the aerospace and built the Seaway instead, um, I moved to the United States. Uh, North American Aviation, the Autonetics Division, where I met this one. <laughs> the guides pushed us from square to square on my straight checkerboard until we finally met in our late 30s. Okay. So, we, we had a common interest. I visited her little church of Spiritual Frontiers, and she was annoyed that I could do, do many of the things. <laughs> He could instantly channel and instantly see things behind his eyelids and all manner of stuff. And I was still sitting there trying to <laughs> have an experience. <laughs> it, it still doesn't happen. I meditate and they're, they somehow the guides don't let me. Yeah, but you get information. I get information, yeah. yeah. Somehow. Anyway, um... In witchcraft in the United States at that time, things were pretty negative. People were busy sacrificing animals and tipping over gravestones and doing all sorts of things like that in the name of witchcraft. They were doing semen runes. <laughs> the worst of those was that in one case they took their counselor out in the woods and sacrificed him. To gain power. To gain power. As if there weren't enough right here to do anything you need to do. What year was that? 67, <laughs> plus or minus. Because we were, well, 68 maybe. No, I think it's before that, but I don't know. Somewhere in there. Let me look. That was in Colorado, I think. That, 69 that counts with Joe's birth. In, yeah, 68 is good. 68. Okay, in the meantime, I had been... Uh, European representative in Munich, Germany, and I worked with um, 
the German Zober as the sorceress. Um, and that was an interesting interval of time where uh, they taught, taught me a lot about handling power and what not to do. Um, one interesting occasion we called down Mars into a statuette, or they did, and it blew up, just like a bomb. Uh, fortunately, and you find in our books, the, you call down power not into your own circle, but you call it down into a circle outside your circle. You don't ever call it into your own circle. And this was an argument we've had on and off with Margot Adler for <laughs> these many years, and Margot and I agree to disagree on it. She just says, well, people will never do it. And I said, Margaret, you should change your book. And she said, well, not as much as you should change your book. <laughs> <laughs> what a summit meeting. <laughs> what a summit meeting. <laughs> okay. That gets us to deciding that we're going to try and straighten all these people out who are trying to learn about witchcraft. And we wrote a little booklet, okay, called Witchcraft, the Way to Serenity. And we sold this through the mail for a dollar, including postage. There was no extra postage, handling and shipping. And um, it's an interesting book. It, it, we're still printing a few of them. Uh, and uh, from this, we started to get students. Correspondence. By students correspondence. We decided... We had had a coven or a group in the house, and anybody who knows what happens when you have a group in the house is the first thing that happens is you start to lose books. So I lost some what I thought were very valuable, irreplaceable books by having people in the house, especially as I was traveling a lot in aerospace. I was international sales manager for Emerson Electric, and I crossed the Atlantic 33 times one year and the only reason it's an odd number is that I came back through Japan and India seven or nine times, something like that. So that adds up to an even number, so I got that. Yeah, yeah. I remember coming back one time from Australia. <laughs> <laughs> to St. Louis. Qantas had changed the flight so that we could actually see the capsule come back in. The first demand thing, it was late July 1969. That is a clear date in my mind. He landed at Atlanta so to lose So I go to the airport, and here's Yvonne waiting, beautiful wife, you know. And I said, I saw the space capsule come. And she said, my water broke. <laughs> <laughs> my water broke at 4 a.m. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to work the next day. <laughs> I wanted to tell them about the space capsule, but they all wanted to know how the baby was, you know. <laughs> so that was a lost thing. Okay. We found out, I have to tell this, please. We found out later, bit by bit, that Gavin and his father and our daughter and I were all together in Wales in the 19th century. Okay. We don't know what other installments happened before that or what will happen in the future, but we know that we were together in the 19th century. Okay, to get on with the, the bit that you've all been waiting for, in 1967 or 68, we put together the draft of this book, um, which got published in 72. Okay. This is of an original copy, and if you have them with the red end papers, remember they're extremely valuable because the, the company who published this promptly went out of business. They promptly went bankrupt. So there were very few copies of this actually printed. In fact, as far as we can tell, only about 2,000 of these were printed on the original run. We don't, that's not an exact number, but it's somewhere in that re region. All right. So, Weschke of Llewellyn Publications and Herman Slater of the Woolock Shop in, Brooklyn New, in York. Brooklyn, New York, got together and decided that these people who wrote this book were heretics, they weren't witches, they were giving away witches' secrets, but they weren't witches. 
um, standard thinking at that time. And still, so and we still. were summoned to Minneapolis to discuss this matter. <laughs> so we went to Minneapolis and we discussed it with Herman, with, not with Herman, with Carl Weschke and his wife. And they had a lady called Vicky Zastro who had re actually read the book, <laughs> which was pretty unusual because neither Carl nor his wife had. And she was there to ask us questions. So the first question was the definitive article. The, the religious Bible, oh gasp. They were really upset about that. They didn't like that at all. So we said, all right, we'll change it. And we did. We changed it to Good Witch's Bible, meaning all the rest were bad. <laughs> <laughs> Try we to didn't, win. We didn't take them too seriously, you can tell. And the other thing they objected to very strongly was the word God. We use God in here as opposed to goddess or whatever. And we were thinking in terms of syncretic monotheism. Now, believe it or not, every single witch is a syncretic monotheist because they all believe, and they, a lot of them, believe in something beyond explanation, etc. And that makes them monotheists, and they don't like being told they're monotheists, but they are. <laughs> they're not ethnic monotheists. They're ethnic monotheists we all disagree and hate because that's the ones who say, if you don't believe our way, you know, if you don't go to church at 11.03 on a Sunday morning, you're evil. Anyway, so we put an explanation in about syncretic versus ethnic monotheists, and they said, well, you didn't specify how old you had to be to be initiated, and we said 18 minimum. And we put that in the Good Witch's Bible too. But nobody queried the word child, and nobody queried the use of a phallus, it, that was perfectly okay with everybody, okay? We came back to, we were busy raising hogs at that time, came back to the farm, and about a month later, we found out that they had decided they were going to have a trial <laughs> in Minneapolis, okay? With Herman as the prosecutor <coughs> and Weske as running the whole proceeding. Well... We all gaily trooped up to Minneapolis. And at that time, we had a lot of students. I mean, we probably had 2,000 students. Active, active, active students. And they were active. In those days, they were really active. So about 600 of them and us ended up in Minneapolis. And um, it's interesting because we actually took Oberon Zell with us. It was Tim in those days before he changed his name four or five times. And uh, that's where he met Morning Glory, but okay. And the trial never came off because obviously you've got Herman Slater and two people from New York versus this mass of people from howling, all over the country. Ha howling pagans and wicked. <laughs> <laughs> and I for blood. distinctly remember Isaac Bonowitz <coughs> was in a big old uh, war surplus great coat and he had on underneath a, a archbishop's black Castle. and red outfit. And he was planning on coming out and saying, bring back the Inquisition. But because they, <laughs> they never, never could run the, the trial, uh, it never happened, you know. And by that time anyway, we had agreed that we'd make the changes that Weske wanted. So the whole thing fell flat. So they decided that they would uh, go after a guy called Eli, who was an Arkansas witch, who also said that he had a new path of witchcraft that came from the mountains of Arkansas, and for some reason Weske didn't like that. And anyway, they, so they went after Eli instead of us. I made a mistake, and it's several times I've made horrendous mistakes in my life, but this was one of them because I told Weske that his new great author was a failed student of the church. <laughs> I told him in private. I didn't tell him in public. And uh, he couldn't take that. 
So if you look in a Llewellyn book, you'll never find Frost's name mentioned anywhere. Not, not in the, references, not nowhere. Not in the bibliography, not in the index. There are, There is no F word in the in Llewellyn <laughs> books. <laughs> By but definition. somehow we managed to lurch along, just barely, without that, without being so honored. Okay, but I want to point out that there was no question at that time about initiating anyone who was who was a junior, okay? This whole thing about the child stems originally, I think, from an argument we had in Columbus, Ohio. We had the um, thing from the newspaper there where we were on a we were on a tour. Yvonne does this better than I do. <laughs> we were on a tour and they objected to us being in Columbus. <laughs> it was already the home of weird, but we just thought we'd add a little sprinkling on top. But they didn't want our type of weird. Anyway, that's of course where they finally decided they would burn us in effigy. In, when was it? five years ago, something like that. And that fell through because nobody would attend their... Witch's Ball. Witch's Ball, where they were going to burn us. Okay. That it was A.J. Drew? Yes. Yes, yes, that's... That was that's a Drew thing. Yeah. But it, a lot of the arguments that have since come down stem from that. One of the problems I have is that I don't suffer fools gladly, I'm afraid. I and tend to laugh at them. And my usual suggestion is scrape it off your shoe and get on with your life. Anyway, um, the school was carrying on happily. If you want to get the next sheet over there, um, yeah, both of them. Let's do them both. Let's oh yeah. start with this one. Okay, take them both. Right. Um, the school was carrying on happily, and Yvonne and I retired. We decided we'd had enough of it, and enough of the bullshit. Forget it. So we elected a new church into the leadership, and we were about to do that again, so the new church had better beware of this might happen to them. A local priest in Dimmit, Texas... Of one of the, the conventional religions. Got a bunch of teenagers upset and they went out to the farm of the new church leaders and a young lady was shot and Shoot. killed in the farmyard. And it was proven that the shot that killed her came from inside the cab of the truck she was riding in. Fairly obviously what happened was the guy took his gun off the rack and it fired inside the truck. Nevertheless, they went to trial. They were found not guilty. But they were, you know, Go on. The, civil, the civil thing afterward, there was still more fallout. The, the parents sued for being an attractive mm -hmm. nuisance. Running an attractive nuisance. That's the old thing about the railroads with the turntables. That if, if you have a pool or a turntable or something, it has to be properly fenced so kids can't get in, etc. They lost. And this is a warning to all Wiccans that if you get involved in some lawsuit and can be proved to be an attractive nuisance and that somebody is damaged because you are an attractive nuisance, you're going to suffer. We appealed to the community, and it was a relatively large community then, for help with the stones because they lost everything. They lost their farm, they lost everything. Not one penny was forthcoming from the community to help the stones. Nor a word of support. Nothing. No letter, nothing. And that kind of disgusted us one more time. Okay. Um, I don't know whether to return to the argument about child or carry on. But, yeah, I think return to the child and um, we talk about the context again um, where the original, um, how you learned of the original. Okay, as we said, I was initiated in Cornwall with a coven. Now in, uh, I've forgotten the date, I'll have to look up the date for you, um, 60, 
six, something like that. I went to a tantric house in the Punjab, in the Indian Punjab, and spent two weeks in the tantric house learning how they did it. And we wrote the book on that, which, by the way, nobody has ever objected to. And further, it's the very few book written by Western authors that has been translated into Hindi and is on sale in India. Um, we realized when we looked at the ritual that was in the tantric house, it was very similar to the ritual through which I had been initiated, okay, in Cornwall. So it's my conclusion that the people who put that ritual together way back when, probably in the late 1920s or early 1930s, used Tantra as the basis for their ritual. Now, if you want to know where Tantra came from, then you've got to go back to 2000 or 4000 BCE because you've got to look at the Vedas. You know, there's no easy way of saying, well, the Tantric ritual came from and these people invented it because we don't know. We have tried desperately, and Ken Day, who I guess most of us know, actually did find the guy who ran the coven in Cornwall. But Ron and Raven and I tried to find him last time we were in Cornwall, and we couldn't do it. Whether he's died or what, we don't know. But we could not trace that coven. But as I say, Ken Day actually traced the place we were at and the coven. And so it really did exist, etc. But we an another clue to tracing the our practices back to the Punjab is the fact that when in the Punjab is the only place where air comes from the east and water comes from the west. Yeah, if you cast a circle in the Punjab, the directions are right because of the air and water and the mountains in the north and sun in the south. And it's actually the only place on earth where that actually happens. When we cast a circle in the west, we don't get air in the east. Look at the weather channel. Any day, air comes from the west to the east. And for a lot of us, water is in the east. Because we... The Atlantic is in the east. If we lived on the west coast, we could put water in the west, but then we have a problem with where to put air. You know, the usual thing. And if you put if you put Earth in the north, what are you standing on? You know, it makes no sense because you're standing on the Earth. So where is Earth? Right there. Okay. Just as spirit is there. So then you're stuck with, well, what am I going to put in the north? Well, the people in Tantric House put time in the north. Old Father Time, white hair, etc., etc. You know. All right. Now, I don't know what else I can say about the source. I can say that we use the word child, and I wasn't necessarily thinking we should have used young woman adult or something, or young adult instead. But nobody questioned it. That's the thing that gets to me, until suddenly somebody puts porno on their computer, and it's our fault. And we have... Two pages, I don't know, is it two or three pages, two pages in a, one book, and only one page is of really importance. And of the 20 books we've written in five different languages, that's the one page that they pick up. You know. We've been at this for 46 years, and it's taken them 46 years to find that page. And uh, we have here, for instance, the statistics for the school for 92, okay? Now, international student body. And this shows that in 1992, we had 14,500 queries, queries, and 1,792 students. Altogether, we've had 60,000 students, okay? Everybody says, well, of course, that's true. The Frost make all that profit from their books. <laughs> One problem doesn't go to us. If there is a prophet, it goes to the church of Wicca. If there is a prophet, 
because we live under a vow of poverty. The IRS can tell you that. Okay, what else? Well, yeah, here's the, world. Here's the vow of poverty for the royalties. Yes, notarized and all. I think the other thing, other couple of things we might want to talk about is the fact that Wicca would not be federally recognized if it wasn't for us. We helped in a case of Detmer versus Landon where the federal judge declared Wicca a valid religion. Butner said Wicca deserves all of the rights of any other religion. And that was based, guess at what? On which book? This book, The Good Witch's Bone. So Butner didn't have any problem with it either. And he's a federal judge. I, I'm at a loss. Yeah, this is, uh, the recent events have rather bewildered us, but maybe someday we'll understand. So if you could rewrite that book. Why? Um, <laughs> well we have rewritten that chapter. In fact, I have a copy of the rewritten uh -huh, chapter. Uh -huh. But nobody wants to publish it. An explanation then of the, of the intention behind, because as people are reacting to that, could you speak to that? Well, the intention is that nobody under 18 gets initiated. Okay, and as I say, the use of child is maybe a mistake, but it was nobody until this latest furor, nobody's ever said that. That's the funny part about this whole thing, you know. And hundreds and thousands of people have read our works. You have there, for instance, the comments of the, the poet laureate of, of Mexico saying what a great thing it was, you know. I'm just a child. I am just a child, mm -hmm. the poet laureate of Mexico. I feel that even when I reach the young age of 95, I will still be just a child. We're all on a learning curve. We're all lurching along, trying to understand. And some of us are trying to get the most mileage out of each semester in school on planet Earth in this big untidy campus. Some of us are learning. Some of us are refusing to learn. Those of us who commit suicide are just playing hooky. They'll be back. <laughs> are there some questions out there? Would you, how about some general questions? Sure. Any day, yes, please. Um, uh, this is just individuals that sent me um, questions. So, uh, very general. What do you consider to be your greatest gift to the pagan community? Getting it recognized. Federal recognition so we can be true to our belief in this sorry nation. It is not Abrahamic, and there are people we're offending. That means we're doing our job. And by the way, we don't think that all Wiccans should agree on everything. We think dispute, positive dispute is good. But when it starts attacking people, that's wrong. Yeah. If you don't like idea A from me or idea B from me, suggest a better way. This is not about character assassination. That's not really spiritual. Right. And we say specifically in the old book, before it was even modified, we say, um, if I can find it, of course, knowledge does not come from books. And if you don't like it, do it your own way. Okay? Just a minute. I must be able to find that. I never can find anything. What's another question? Now we can go on. <laughs> while, you find it, while you find it. Who or what was the greatest influence in developing your spiritual path and why? <gasps> the greatest. The greatest influence was the Coven of Boskidman in Cornwall. Um, a guy called Graham Howe, who nobody remembers anymore, wrote... Uh, the Mind of the Druid. Mind of the Druid, which you can still buy because uh, it's been republished. Uh, I still can't understand it all, but still. Yeah. 
uh, talking about getting stoned. <laughs> um, and my greatest influence, the door that opened for me, perhaps most importantly, was the spiritual, spiritualist church that began everything and made the rest of this possible. Um, I mean, I mean, you want to, because I think they've covered a lot of those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will say that as, as a recovering Baptist, I can reflect now and, and realize that the two influences that made my life fit me, in contrast to my earlier life, that plainly did not fit, the two influences were the realization that I qualified as Mensa, and finding the spiritualist church and the craft, the craft that I heard through Gavin for the first time. He opened that second door for me and the rest is history. I won't talk about being proud, but I'll, I'll talk about being grateful. Grateful for what has been possible. The idea is not just to swallow a religion pill handed to you by an authority figure but instead try, test, probe, investigate. We cannot emphasize it too strongly that you should encourage in yourself that skepticism which you may have been told is wrong. The only way to come to the truth you can really believe in is to find out which you believe. Through the thoughtful elimination of errors and through finding new, older, better ways. Okay. How can you be guided? Instead of the authority and set of absolute, we offer a pathway. I, I'm going to interpret this question and rewrite it a little bit from Darwin Dodd, because it's very long. Um, have you ever been um, attacked by Christians for those writings? Or hmm. have they all been pagans? Most of the attacks that have been noticeable have been by pagans. Um, the Christians attacked us once in, uh, we lived in St. Charles, Missouri, and the book was published, and the local high school, one class in the local high school decided that uh, they would like us to come and talk to the class. So the Christians went and got an injunction against us coming to talk to the high school. So the students protested, and actually the students learned a lot because they went and got the injunctions squashed. They just had National Law Day or something on campus, and some kind of law day, and they were eager to try out what they just learned. And they decided they would have us talk to the whole student body. Okay, not just one class now. So here we are, they said, well, uh, they can talk provided we talk first, the Christians. So the Christians got up and talked for half an hour, the usual boring stuff, and we got up to walk up to the platform and they served us with another injunction. And the students erupted. <laughs> they were so pissed off, they'd sat there for half an hour listening to the stuff they'd heard all their lives. But we had expected that sort of thing, so we had reserved a local theater and uh, told them, hey, you know, come down to the theater and we'll give you the presentation. So we did the presentation and the students enjoyed it and they went back and sued the lady who got the injunction. And she lost. And the funny part was that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch of that day has a front page picture of the one of the local ministers going like this to me and I'm just standing there sort of looking at him. <laughs> what a vignette. What the a vignette. First dispatch was very positive for us. And their Pulitzer Prize winning, or did they invent the Pulitzer? But that's the only time we really had a Christian attack, but we had many, many pagan attacks. Oh, there, was the, there was the night when we were on the pig farm and we had just had a fitted into our old schoolhouse that was our residence. We just fitted a new kitchen cabinet, row of cabinets. And uh, one Saturday night the bars closed and a bunch of young studs got into their car and they decided they were going to shoot up the witches. So we had bullets through the window that night. 
with a, a six-year-old child in the house. They didn't hurt anything, but they sure wounded our kitchen cabinet, brand new. Oh. That, that recently happened down in uh, Florida. Um, Kira, the one that writes uh, Rupert's Tales, mm -hmm. the children's book, yeah. It was teenagers coming by and they had shot at her house. And yes. The bullet holes in her window, instead of putting in new windows, she made them into spider webs. <laughs> I see. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. They, they finally got to confront their teenagers and set them straight, and everything is good now. Yeah, right. we did the same thing because we happened to live, the farm happened to go along the road, and Yvonne was at the one end driveway, and I was at the other end driveway, and when they drove by the following Saturday night, I drove the tractor across the road where they were trying to go, and Yvonne drove a, the car across the other road, and they were trapped. <laughs> they, had, they had come into our driveway. You haven't seen anything until you've seen Yvonne crouched with a double barrel shotgun behind, <laughs> behind the tractor tire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honey. Can you set them straight? We, yeah. Um, it can be educational. It can be educational when you fasten them down and make them listen. Do, do you guys have any more books that you're gonna that you're coming out with? Uh, we've got one more in the hopper, but I'm not sure we're gonna. It's we're lazy. <laughs> we're getting older. Deserve to be. When I want to read something about the craft, you know, I I opened that one book of Gene Owls about the clan of the cave bear. It opens with the scene of a, a young girl getting initiated in a cave in a smoky atmosphere. She's initiated with a, a bone with notches on it. The shaman does it, and it's a holy ritual. And they still do it. The clan of the cave bear. Yeah. Not the movie, the book. The, yeah, the book. One of the books, and I, the title escapes me. If you look at the books we've got over here, madam, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't you think we've done enough? <laughs> Would you like me to... Uh, yeah, I'd like one, you to pan through them. The, yeah, there may be somebody we haven't offended. Yeah, there are 20 books in five different languages, hmm? I'm going to get pictures of those too. Okay. <laughs> but I can incorporate. Okay. Thank so, thank you. you guys seem uh, like you've got. Uh, like you're winding down, is there anything you'd like to say to everybody? <laughs> I'll just, I'll be very soft. If somebody knows a better way, we'd like to hear it. To our face, in, expressed in second person singular or second person plural, not those people. But here's my thought and I'll share it with you. We'd like that. That could be described as rational behavior. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> we see the pagan community being continually infiltrated by what we would call Christian ideals. And I think you're gonna, we're going backwards, not forwards. I think in the 60s and 70s, we were free and we were happy, and now we're back uptight. Practicing more of the ways, the habits of thinking that we see in hmm. conventional yeah. religions. There is so much anger out there that uh, you've got to get over the anger and be, use it for something positive. We're planning on starting an app. Uh, Always positive. Or angry positive. Angry. Positive pagans. Yeah. Or active positive pagans. Angry. Angry positive pagans where they can post things that they have done for the community. Positive things. Right. Positive things. Adopt a highway. Do an animal shelter. Volunteer someplace. Do a... Well, you may be too marked to work at a children's center. <laughs> One of our churches in um, uh, Springfield, for instance, runs a, a children's clothing, clothing exchange. exchange. And book exchange. 
and mm. they liaise that same covenant liaises with restaurants in Springfield area to do a Thanksgiving dinner for inmates to donate Thanksgiving dinners. For and they do solstice meals. They put together cans and stuff like that, which they deliver to indigent families in the Springfield area. In the name of the craft. We tried to start a soup kitchen. We had all the equipment and we needed two or three pagans to run it. Do you think we could find them? No way. We had all X service equipment available to us to run it, but they won't do it, wouldn't do it. And so we were at a meeting in Baltimore and uh, a Christian lady said, give me the equipment, I'll do it. She was a Methodist. So Methodism now gets the glory they're earning and pagans are still sitting behind a bush sucking their thumbs. So get out there and be positive. The rituals in the witches' Bible are not our creation, they're history. Right, they're from a coven in Cornwall who got it, in our opinion, from the East. But we can't prove that. Right. And so, when, when you say child, what exactly do you mean in the, in the witch's Bible? What was your intention? We mean somebody who is not aware. You read the piece from the, um, the poet laureate of, what's it, what did of, he say? Of Mexico. Let me read that, I love it so, may I read I'm it? I'm 93 that? years old and I'm still a child. When we mean child, when we write child, we mean it in the sense that the poet laureate of Mexico meant it. Here's what he wrote, dedicated to all the children. My name is Chiapas, which means, I'm sorry, grandfather of peace. The name was given to me by the Indians of my land, and I hold this name with pride. In my many years of existence, I've never felt more like a child than I do now. This new world which I've embarked on has made me feel like an alien in my own land. The many years of my studies before entering the school of Wicca seem like just a drop of rain now. I've only completed the basic witchcraft course, but the outside reading and the studies I've done have opened the door even more for me. As a grown man, I look in the mirror and all I see is a child of the Creator who's looking and praying to the God and Goddess for guidance through the new and enchanted world. I feel that even when I reach the young age of 95, I will still be just a child. For even now, I wish on a falling star, chase a leaf in the wind, and believe in witches. So from this child to all, blessed be the children. So let it be. So in this book, um, can you speak to that part where it says when a child develops to a stage where the physical attributes of reproduction are present, he can become a full member of the coven? Can you speak to that in the context of um, when you, what you think? No, you're taking it out of context because uh -huh. if you go back about three pages, it says specifically uh, it has to be 18 to become a full member of the coven, to be initiated. And we say in many of our works, whatever you do, in circle or out of circle, in whatever you do in the name of the craft, never, never break a civil law of the land. Never do any illegal act. We know there are people waiting behind every bush, waiting to leap up and scream, look what the witches are doing, look what the witches are doing. We know that for a fact. So we say over and over, do not break a civil law. Has any of your initiates ever questioned this of you? Ha no. Have they ever asked? No initiative of ours has ever asked about, has challenged our definition of age of accountability or age of choice. Nor have they questioned our, our 
pronouncement about breaking the law of the land. That's it. Have you ever initiated somebody? What's the youngest age you've ever initiated? Oh, That's a good question. Youngest, 24 or 25? The, the youngest no. age of an initiate? I wouldn't know. We have a problem here because we've had 60,000 students. And yes, I remember most of the initiates, but not all of them. But I would think 24, mid-20s, because there's no, f me personally, um, I need a physical, I need a mental connection, or what Raven calls a heart connection, with somebody we're going to initiate. And uh, I don't, don't get that with very young people, you know. How about you, even after some young man, some... I deny everything. <laughs> <laughs> I deny everything. <laughs> there are, there's an actual or two that I look at and I think yum yum, but uh, it goes, it doesn't go beyond my naughty mind. <laughs> it would, but it never mind. No, never mind. Turn over and go to sleep. Are you guys up to doing the tango? <laughs> Say that again. Are we up to doing the tango? <laughs> no, I can't tango, but these two can. Ron and Raven can. And they can say where they learned it. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're ready to hand on that baton. <laughs> so. Oh, I'll say this, though. I'll get up off my deathbed to dance tango. Or samba. Samba would do. If there's a beat, I'll get up on my hind legs. <laughs> it's so much easier when you know no shame. <laughs> Sing me a song. Oh, yes. Okay. Ron, could you reach in the briefcase there in the upper flap and the, the back one? Yeah, six minutes. Near again the burning. Oh, boy. We want to get Raven to put it on the half at the same time. Not, we're not cold without a rehearsal. Okay, here's one verse of a song that came to me, on, through me, on the Ocracoke Ferry a long time ago. Sometimes the guides open my head and put something in, and it comes out. It's not my own creation, so I won't claim credit for it, but the guides use me sometimes, and here it is. The title is Near Again the Burning. Shoot. Like the phoenix from the ashes, like sunshine after rain, the light of truth is breaking through gloom of sin and pain. Away with cults and idols, away with threats of hell. The elder ones shall reign supreme in hearts where love doth dwell. Be joyful, be joyful, lift up your hearts and sing. Gather we friends together and dance all in a ring. Glad witches come gather to the old true ways returning to freedom and to truth and light. And near again the burning. Well, how it came up was um, the context of the time period that he wrote the book. A, a it isn't it isn't a ritual that he wrote. It's a ritual that he has recorded that goes way, way, way back to you know, pre-industrial times. Uh, but the time period when he wrote that book, um, The Summer of Love, people weren't, didn't have quite the number of hang-ups and concerns and, and, and worries about sexuality that we have now. Um, but he never intended it to be about 12-year-old girls. No, no. No, or boys either. Can you say that in a, in a whole way so you're, uh, it's not me saying this? 
I think the key to this business is that if you want to initiate somebody, you have to put them through a pretty good course of instruction. Nowadays, it seems common that you say to somebody, come down on Friday and we'll initiate you. Or do a drive-through. Oh, it's a drive-through initiation. That's not the way we thought of initiation. We thought of initiation as a long, probably two-year period. And in the course, it, it was set for the minimum of one year. And very few people made it in one year. But they had to be an intelligent adult, if you like. Uh, but using the word adult is, is wrong too, because now we don't know how we define adult. It used to be 18, now it's 21, now it's 25, I'm told. We, uh, but in, if you go back to these societies, and as soon as the lady had the first period, or the first moon time, as we prefer to call it, then they should know all about sex. And they probably should go through a sexual ritual. And uh, one of the things we don't do, and it's coming back gradually, is a puberty ritual. People are calling it a blood ritual, and I hate them calling it that. It's a puberty ritual, uh, both for boys and girls. You know, we've got covens out in Colorado who are doing a very good one for the boys who seem to be forgotten in this. Yeah, yeah. You we've know. we've heard of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. We haven't heard of teen rites for Wiccan pagan children. And we want to bring back sealing and blessing for for In children. Infants or newbies, uh, with, uh, which is as much a sealing and blessing of the parents, the responsible guardians, as it is of the infant itself. Our group of churches, small though it is, is talking about the fact that the Sealing and blessing is the promise of the community to look after the child. The initiation is the promise of the child to the community. And see, I use the word child again, because the, the person is not yet initiated. And uh, child in this case, in this context, child is almost con synonymous with candidate. But the rituals that we're using, they're fully described in here, okay? And if you want to burn a book, you better burn this one, because this is full of sex, okay? And this book fully describes my initiation into a coven and exactly what happened. And the thing is, those, the ritual that they, they used goes back to the Vedas. It goes way, way back. And should we change it? I don't think we should change it. People are very fond of changing things. The, the society, the pagan society, is so uptight now that they've even changed the charge to the goddess. Yeah, <laughs> made it smooth below the waist. They've taken out, you know, we'll have a party and do a little sex after. Uh, and that's in the charge of the goddess, you know, as a, as a sign that you be free, you shall be naked in your rights. That's not in it for most people, because they've never read Aradia or Leyland's work. And so uh, that gets me in trouble again, because I say, why don't you read the original? And don't see what you're doing. And don't change it. You, right. don't, you don't have any right to change it. To tidy things up. That's not the way... Life, real life is. You don't know what you do. You, the the what sort of unforeseen consequences, right? You make yeah. a change and the whole world changes. You, you can We can start raving off and she'll talk for forever about people med meddling with the food chain. Yes, and the chemicals that we're consuming these days. We don't know what we're doing. We're all vegan. Yeah. Yes, raw vegans, yes, yes, raw vegans have a point. Look around you, look around you. Can't wait to see the baby. So when the ritual was originally written, 
Can you talk about what was happening? Um, if you think it was written 2,000 years ago, talk about life expectancy and when a person was expected to marry. Okay, life expectancy, we don't know. And the reason for that is very interesting in that the younger the bones, the more rapidly they decay. So the archaeologists can't really tell you what the life expectancy was because all of the young bones are missing. Okay. And there's a tendency to say that the life expectancy was very low, but we find that um, there were people who had operations on the head, trepanning, trepanning operations, who skull, recovered from it. Skull repairers, after battles, for instance. And they recovered from it. So that says they were quite old, and some of those bones looked like the people were 300 years old. But Fertility was very important to those people. Uh, although life expectancy is the wrong thing to look at because we don't know what the life expectancy was, we do know that people did not have, people did tend to die early, but we don't know how many. It's like how many witches were birthed. Some people say a hundred thousand. If I include heretics, I can get it up to several million without even trying. Um, where were we? Okay, so marriage, fertility. You you've got a high interest in fertility because you want to continue the race. Don't forget, we were not overcrowded then. We had to repopulate the world. Uh, Seventy thousand years ago, everybody except four breeding pairs were wiped out. There were no humans except four breeding pairs. Microchondrial DNA shows that that's all that we're left. But now, how do we get from four breeding pairs to the number of people we've got? Fertility was very important. So they bred as early as they could. You know, When we were raising hogs, we would breed the uh, gilts, the what's it? Pig virgins. Pig virgins, after their first moon time. We'd give them the first moon time, and then the second moon time they would be bred. And I'm sure, pretty sure, that's what they did with humans. Um, we know that from certain tribals, especially in Africa, people are still doing that. They're still breeding the girls. After they give them one moon time, and then they, they breed them because of fertility. They need the people. And there was no such thing as a death sentence for a crime. The per person would be shunned or ridiculed, but they were still counted as a valuable member of the community because their contribution was necessary if the community was to survive. It's and interesting. That, that thinking persists in some ways to this day, in this, in this, even in this culture. The old English laws, or the old Welsh laws, the laws of High Will Far said, that a noble can marry a commoner provided she's had two healthy children, provided she's a virgin and had two healthy children. That virgin meant a virtuous woman. It didn't mean intact, it was an entirely different meaning. But the law is still there, and the Welsh say, you know, that's the law. So <laughs> far as I can remember, the word virgin does not appear in the what we call the biblical book of Isaiah. The, the word there is young woman. What else? Is there anybody we haven't offended? <laughs> <laughs> Did we get to it? I think so. I think they've covered a lot of uh, Read the book. Read the book. I, Read there, the book. I have that book. <laughs> it's our, it's our dream. I, I, I don't uh, I apologize if you address this while I was out of the room, but there is one thing. In, in the community, um, elders or anyone has so much more to offer when they we aren't attacking each other. Could, could you speak to that aspect of the community of what you've seen, those who can work together versus those who feel compelled to ticket their leadership and what it's done to the community as a whole? Once I heard someone say, the pagan community eats its leaders. 
where there are those among us who want to e emphasize negative thinking and attack anybody within range, especially the leaders, but if they would devote that energy to positive goals, positive thinking, we could really make this a different nation than it is. We could make it a different nation if only, if only. Apparently, some pagans have never heard of the law of attraction. What I put out is what I will draw to myself. That belief makes me stop and consider sometimes before I open my mouth, <laughs> before I commit a deed. That what it really stops her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> What's left to lose at this stage? <laughs> There are times when that, that idea, that belief, keeps me from uttering a pungent thought or committing a pungent deed. Just because I don't want to attract negativity to myself. I've had enough scars and wounds this incarnation. I don't want to do any more. I probably won't use this question, but I just it drives me nuts that T. Thorne Coyle calls you feet of clay. And I, I just don't get that. People call us feet of clay. Well, what's new? Mm -hmm. We're human beings. We're human beings. What, what does she mean by that? That there's no substance there? Or? I have no idea what people mean. We are giving our very best. One <coughs> PhD in physics, one Mensa member with scars. We need to correct we're, that. We're giving our best. What, PhD? I have a DSC. It's which is really PhD is the closest U.S. equivalent. Translate in, in English to DSC. Um, we've thought about these things. And if somebody doesn't like our stuff, I'd like to see them replace it with something better. Have, have people like that um, called you on the phone no. to discuss any of this? No. No, no. There's never been a question, there's never been a second person singular discussion. You say this, and what so do you mean by it? So they're cowards. They, they, okay. no, they don't. words and they don't come to you. I, I have recalled years at festivals where they said that they were going to come and confront them, the frogs. We were going to come come to that festival and we were going to confront them and we were going to have this long public debate and they waited. They, had a, they set up a yeah, we had this workshop, come and confront us. Gavin and Yvonne tell all. And yeah, we offer that, we offer that them. about every year. Gavin, you want to tell all, yeah. and we answer any. We offer to answer any questions 